All right, thanks very much, uh, and thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. So, um, Um, so I want to talk very quickly about um, sort of air pollution in global health uh, context. I think many people know about air pollution in their local communities, perhaps in their countries, what the impacts are, but talk a little bit about uh, globally. And then how it's um, in a place with development transitions as we actually think about global health. We really need to think about development as, as all of you know. And then and really to discuss both some, some challenges and also some opportunities. Uh, for improvement, and, and this is actually where I think air pollution management intersects with climate change mitigation. So um, I think this is probably familiar to most of you. This is from the uh, comparative risk assessment project, uh, and this is this exercise is now uh, sort of being redone as part of the global urban disease pro project, looking at uh, a series of major risk factors and the diversion of disease that can be attributed to them. I'll just point out, um, you can see the arrows on the top, tobacco at this time is estimated to kill around 5 million people per year, uh, indoor air pollution from solid fuel, so this is household solid fuel use, about 2 million people per year, and urban air pollution, um, around a million people uh, per year. These are all, to some extent, sort of air pollution uh, problems. I'm going to focus um, on this, this issue of, of outdoor um, urban and air pollution for, for most of the, most of the uh, remainder of the talk, but obviously some of the things intersect. And just, just to um, uh, discuss very briefly this issue of household solid fuel use, um, uh, you can see here sort of the percentage of households exposed uh, to household air pollution. Um, when you look actually across the world in terms of the population basis, about half the world's uh, population still cooks uh, with solid fuels. Um, these are wood, coal, dung, crop residues, charcoal, primarily affecting uh, young children in, in the way of acute respiratory infections and women who develop chronic lung disease, um, although have never smoked a cigarette in their life. Um, so this is really one of the great global health uh, problems, arguably one of the great environmental health problems of the world, and it's really just now, actually, um, that I think it's really achieving uh, due attention from from major international organizations. Uh, and I'll come back to this uh, just at, at the end. Now, focusing just on, on urban outdoor air pollution, um, so these previous estimates, 800,000 deaths per year, 6.5 million DALIs. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about Asia, um, first of all, because that's what I know best, uh, where most of my work now is focused, but also because about two-thirds of this burden actually occurs uh, in rapidly urbanizing Asia. Um, this map you can see is uh, estimates from a uh, 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 chemical uh, transport model uh, as well as combined with satellite observations of um, outdoor air pollution levels around the world. Um, we have to use these models and satellite observations because actually for much of the developing world we have no measurements on the ground. So this is something that's changing but obviously needs to change more. Um, with the exception of, of uh, what you can see over northern Africa, so that's actually um, windblown dust. Um, all the other um, uh, hotspots uh, for air pollution are anthropogenic. So you can see actually in, in uh, South Asia, uh, in, in China, Southeast Asia, to some extent still in, in Eastern Europe, a little bit in, in Central Latin America, some, some rather high um, levels of air pollution. But actually, um, if we look um, a bit more closely, um, and this is a, really a snapshot of measurements, um, again, because we don't have observations from around the world. Cities um, around the world, um, large and small cities. Um, and what you're seeing on the, the horizontal lines there are, um, so the solid line is the air quality guideline from the World Health Organization. So this is, to some extent, our best guess of sort of a health-based guideline, although we in fact know that there's no safe level. Uh, for on a population basis for air pollution. There's no evidence of a population level threshold. So actually, uh, about 80% of the world's population is above the World Health Organization guideline. Um, and we also had developed sort of interim targets because actually just having an unachievable guideline really isn't very helpful uh, to most countries that are well above it. Uh, you can see, for example, in, in uh, the cities where we had observations in Asia, most of them um, are actually above 
the first interim guideline, uh, let alone the, um, the, the, the World Health Organization guideline. Um, Seattle's um, on the far uh, right-hand side. Uh, this is one of the cleanest cities uh, in the world uh, for its size, uh, <laughs> uh, but still very easy to measure um, health impacts related to air pollution in Seattle. Um, I've just thrown down just uh, some um, mega cities, um, uh, and, and in parentheses are their, their rank in terms of their population uh, and showing the population size. And I'm not going to sort of point out where they are, but basically there's no correlation between the size of the city um, and the level of air pollution. And even there's no sort of correlation within a region. And in fact, very little correlation even within uh, countries of simil similar levels of, of um, uh, of geography. Uh, so, what you very quickly conclude from this that it's that it's not the size of the city that matters; it's actually its level of development. And, and I don't think this is really a surprise to anybody in in this audience. So, for example, Tokyo, which is the largest metropolitan area in the world, uh, actually is one of the cleanest cities in Asia. And it's only now, actually, that air air quality is actually deteriorating, not because of local influences, but actually because of regional influences. Uh, that have nothing to do with actually what's going on uh, in Tokyo, except perhaps their, their consumption of goods. Uh, the same thing in, in the U.S. In New York City, um, 20 million people, and I, I was just there a few weeks ago, and you think about it, it's actually astounding. 20 million people, that's, it's clean uh, in terms of air quality. It's amazing. Um, L.A., um, smaller city, um, but you can see it's not, not quite as clean, but still relative to what we see in many cities of Asia. Um, uh, uh, still rel relatively clean. So really, it's, it's development that we need to think about. And this is um, uh, the environmental Kuznets curve uh, showing sort of the, the theoretical pathway um, that countries have followed or, or um, are supposed to follow, I guess, uh, if we look back historically in terms of the relationship between pollution and development level. Um, and I would just add that this, this pattern can be broken. But this is what we, we tend to have seen in that there's a period where um, actually environmental degradation in general um, is, is relatively low, but as countries develop, um, uh, that development uh, coincides actually with some level of environmental degradation. Uh, this, is, this is general, this doesn't just apply to air pollution. Uh, and then at some point the development level is, is high enough that attention can be paid uh, to this environmental degradation and, and the fact that that improved uh, somewhat. So the trick really is is to leapfrog uh, some of some of these steps uh, in this pattern. And I'll give you some examples of, of where where this actually has occurred. So Thailand uh, is one example, uh, and what you can see on the left uh, hand side here is uh, look at the fuel consumption. That's gasoline uh, on the left and diesel uh, in the center there. Uh, both in Bangkok, uh, in the region around Bangkok, and at a countrywide level, this is looking over uh, about a, a little more than a 10-year period in the mid-90s to 2005, um, consumption has increased okay, uh, with development. So more people are able to afford uh, vehicles, uh, more fuel consumed. Um, over on the right-hand side are a number of air pollutants, uh, and for the most part, um, they've all decreased. And so there's a decrease, actually, in air pollution both countrywide, in Bangkok, and regionally, that, that actually coincides with this, this period of increased fuel consumption. So this is a good thing. This is, this is the anti-message to, you know, we can't control uh, 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 emissions of pollutants because it's going to affect the economy. And we actually know this very well from what's happened uh, in, in North America. And this is also true uh, in, in rapidly developing countries. So what happened? Well, a whole series of measures were put in place in terms of uh, vehicle emissions, catalytic converters, shifts in technology to force their engines. Um, so it's technology, but it's also actions, management, things like roadside inspections. We know actually that in terms of uh, vehicles and air pollution, uh, it's a very, very small percentage of the vehicles creating the largest uh, proportion of the pollution. So it, in, in this country, it's about 2% of the vehicles created over 90% of the air pollution. Uh, so it's a matter of identifying them and getting them off the road. So that's why we have uh, roadside inspections or vehicle inspection and maintenance programs with, that are actually familiar to, to many of us. Uh, improvements in fuel and, and fuel changes uh, in effect as well. So that's uh, Thailand. We actually look more generally uh, in Asia. We see similar patterns, and this is just looking at 
trends. This is now um, 1990 to 2005 in primary energy consumption. And then uh, the bottom here, trends in transportation fuel consumption. And really just staggering sort of linear uh, um, or relatively linear increases uh, over this period um, uh, in all, all locations um, uh, in, in Asia. And at the same time, again, to the best of our abilities, when we look in cities, um, we actually see general uh, decreases in levels of air pollution. This is uh, uh, estimates from a World Bank uh, model, again, because we don't have all the measurements um, everywhere. Uh, in particulate matter, one of the pollutants that we're most concerned with in terms of, of human health impacts. 